All right, people are still joining, but I want to be mindful of time because I know our presenter has a lot of material to cover today. So I'm going to get us started with just a few announcements and then I'll be turning it over uh, for the presentation and question and answer time. So again, thank you all for being here. It's wonderful to see such a wide range of majors, grad years, and some folks who've identified themselves as visitors. We would call you friends of the college. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for being here today. My name is Joelle Larson. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations for the College of Science and Engineering. And for the last several years, I have partnered with the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory to do a research presentation and a visit to the research wind turbine down in Rosemount at Umore Park, which you'll learn a little bit more about today. The facility down there is very small, so the capacity for those events has been really limited, and we're really excited to be able to welcome so many more of you to the presentation today than we've been able to in the past uh, to share some really cool information about this uh, unique research wind turbine and facility that the U has down in Umar Park. So, um, if you're having any difficulty with your audio, you can always dial in by phone to uh, hear the audio portion of the presentation. Uh, the directions for that are on your screen and they were also included on the Zoom reminder email you would have gotten about an hour ago. Um, uh, just a note, we are recording this presentation and the recording will be shared with everyone who registered next week as soon as we're able to get it up on the college's YouTube channel. And we will be taking Q&A throughout the presentation. So uh, you should see a Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. Um, please put in a question if you have one there. Everybody has the ability to see all the other questions and like or upvote the questions. Please do that because during the presentation, we'll stop a couple of times to take questions and we'll take the most popular at that time. And then we'll use whatever time we have remaining at the end for as many other questions as we're able to get to. So um, do feel free to use the Q&A um, to put your questions. Don't use the chat. The Q&A is where you want to put questions as you have them. And before I turn it over, just a little bit of information about our speaker. Uh, Chris Millerin is an associate engineer at SAFL, and he's also a graduate of the College of Science and Engineering. He graduated in 2011 with a civil engineering degree. And even before he graduated, he was working at SAFL and was part of the ELOS Wind Research Field Station. He was there when uh, the project first came into inception through the procurement and construction of the wind turbine. He acted as SAFL's on-site representative overseeing the project. And after graduation, he joined SAFL full-time as the lead engineer handling all the daily research and maintenance tasks related to the wind turbine, which he'll tell you about today. There's been a really diverse range of research that's taken place at the wind turbine, and he'll share uh, as much information about that as we have time for today, but uh, he'll cover several projects. And one other note, I do have the live transcript function on. If you don't want to see a live transcript, uh, there is a button down at the bottom um, of your controls and you're able to turn it off in, in that area. So with that, I'm gonna stop my screen share and I'm gonna turn it over to Barbara Heitkamp from St. Anthony Falls Laboratory. Thanks a lot, Joelle. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, really excited to be able to help host this event today. Um, I'm Barbara Heitkamp. Um, I'm the communication specialist for the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory. And what that translates into is that I get the uh, opportunity to be able to tell people the story of the laboratory and the research that we do there. So I run the website, I run all of the social media, and also events where we're able to welcome folks like you to be able to tell you a little bit about our research, our facilities, and what we're doing at this somewhat nondescript building that's not on campus. Um, for those of you who haven't visited the laboratory, the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory is a interdisciplinary fluid mechanics education and research facility that is under the College of Science and Engineering. We are not on campus. We are actually located directly across from downtown, just downstream of the St. Anthony Falls. Um, and uh, the picture that you're seeing on the screen there is actually taken from the Stone Arch Bridge. 
So um, a really unique facility. We've been there for 80 years. The lab con was constructed from 1936 and was dedicated in 1938. So we celebrated our 80th anniversary uh, just, uh, just a few uh, years ago. Um, if you look inside, and Chris, if you could advance the, to the next slide, you're going to find a host of experimental facilities that we use to conduct research as it relates to the physics of fluid flow, um, looking at river and stream restoration, environmental um, fluid mechanics, stormwater related issues, nutrients, rural versus um, urban uses of water, um, and how do we mitigate the impacts that we as humans have on those landscapes. Um, renewable energy, both in water and in air, obviously, as Chris is going to tell you about today, and much more. Uh, we host over 15 faculty from different departments on campus. Um, they bring their research groups to our facility to conduct research, and we also have our own full team of researchers on site, of which Chris is one, uh, the one who's going to be speaking today. Um, it's a cool place. Uh, obviously, at this time, we are not welcoming tours of our facility. Um, we have started to allow some researchers back into the building, though. So we are operating under the, the Sunrise Plan that CSE has um, uh, and the university has put forth. Um, but if and when we are able to start hosting tours again, uh, we have public tours. We've also held private tours, including for the CSE alumni group. So if you go to events.umn.edu and you search SAFL, uh, when those tours start popping up again, you'd be able to register. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. I will be the one that's monitoring the Q&A. And so as Joelle mentioned, um, as you have questions, type them into that Q&A box. If you're interested in hearing the answer to the question, upvote it. And at the different periods where we take a small break, I'll go ahead and ask Chris some of the most upvoted questions. And then we'll continue to kind of move along as well. So with that, Chris, I'll turn it over to you. All right, <clears throat> can everybody hear me okay? Got some nods, okay, great. Uh, hi everybody, uh, welcome to my basement in St. Paul. Um, like Joelle said, we normally do this in a, an office space at Umore Park about five miles from the wind turbine. I give a presentation and then uh, people have the opportunity to walk out to the wind turbine. I'll drive out and then uh, watch it shut down and then we walk up and people can look up into the tower and, and get a look at that up close and personal. Unfortunately, with COVID-19, we're not able to do that. So you get to hang out with me in my basement and um, look at some of the research. We added a couple videos to show you what it's like in the turbine, but um, yeah, let's get started. So first, I get this question a lot. What's up with the name? Um, sometimes it's in all caps, so people think it's an acronym, but really it's, it's the Greek god of the wind. Eolos is the Greek god of the wind. It's, it's spelled different ways, a lot of times with an A. But the story is that uh, when we first were awarded our grant, the director of our lab at the time was Greek. So he named it after the Greek god of the wind. And that's, that's how we got our name. Uh, but we were established in 2010 through a US Department of Energy grant. The funds were made available through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And we had three main goals with that grant. Uh, we were to build a, a field research station with a wind turbine and associated uh, measurement systems. Um, we had six different research topics that were a part of our proposal, so we conducted research on those. And we also established a course for a few semesters that offered some um, basics on wind energy and, and how, it, how it works and how it's deployed around the country. Uh, the next part here is about Umore Park. A lot of people have questions about the facility because there's, if you've ever driven through Rosemont near Rosemont Park or uh, Umore Park, there's just a lot of old shells of buildings left and that's because uh, during World War II it was a gunpowder plant. Uh, it used to be farmland and then in World War II it became a, a gunpowder plant. It employed 10,000 people at one point. Uh, it was never fully completed and online before the war ended uh, but th that's the property it was sold to the university I think in like the 60s and it's been a part of the university ever since. It's primarily used for agricultural research and a few other things but uh, we were given uh, 80 acres of that property to use for wind energy research. Uh, it's not necessarily the windiest site around, but the grant stip stipulated that the facility needed to be within 50 miles of the main university campus uh, so that it could be more easily accessible for education and students to come out and do research. So it's, it's fairly windy. It's not, um, not the windiest site ever, but it, it, does, it does what it needs to do. 
Um, so some of you might be aware of how wind turbines work. Um, I, before I go any farther, I just want to remind everybody to ask questions, uh, submit them in the Q&A. Uh, usually my favorite part of the, giving this talk is that there's a lot of audience interaction. Uh, it's a, typically the CSE alumni group is a very interactive group. They have a lot of really good questions. A lot of times anticipating where my slides are going to go next before I even get there. Uh, so uh, I kind of miss that being in my basement. So if, if you do have questions, please do submit them during the Q&A. There's going to be three or four different stops in here uh, where Barbara can uh, ask me the questions and I can try to answer them for you. So please, please do that. Um, so just a basic definition of a wind turbine. It's, it's really just a device that extracts energy from the wind and converts it to electrical energy. And you can compute the power that's available in the wind with, with the equation I have here. And uh, I just want to highlight a couple things about this. Um, can you see my mouse, Barbara, Joel? Okay, I got some nods. Okay, so the A here is the rotor area. This is the area of the circle swept out by the rotor. And V is the wind speed. So the power output increases proportional to the area of the rotor, but it increases with the cube of wind velocity. So for higher wind speeds, you get much more power. Uh, so obviously you want to build your turbine in the windiest spot you can find. But after you've done that, you don't have control over the wind anymore. Um, that's, but what you can control is the size of your turbine. And that's why you've seen them getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we've been able to make them bigger and bigger. Because A in that is really the one variable you can control in this. You can make your turbine bigger. Um, and then there's this coefficient at the end, the power coefficient. And this is about uh, 0.48 for our wind turbine. The, most wind turbines are in that range, 0.45 to, uh, to about 0.48. And, and this is just a limit. It's like a physical limit on how much power you can extract from the wind. And essentially what, what that is, is if you're extracting too much power from the wind, you're essentially blocking the wind from traveling through the rotor. And eventually the wind just starts to go around your turbine. It, it becomes like a rock in the stream. It, it just goes around you. And so you, you really can only capture about, for our wind turbine, 48% of the wind or the energy that's available in the wind. And that's just because otherwise the wind's just gonna go around you. Uh, it takes the path of least resistance essentially. Uh, these are standard wind turbine components. Um, so you've got the, the rotor and the blades are attached to the hub here. Inside the hub, we have the pitch system. So each of the three blades on the wind turbine um, change their angle of attack. They, uh, on the hub, they're mounted to giant bearings and gear teeth. And on our wind turbine, there's big servo motors with gearboxes that turn the blades back and forth. They have about a 90 degree range of motion. Um, during operation, they're pitched almost parallel to the direction of rotation. And in the event of a shutdown for uh, either a, a problem with the machinery or if you're gonna go do maintenance, you pitch the, the blades 90 degrees so that the flat surface is um, in the direction of the rotation and it essentially acts as a giant air brake. Right? There's this big surface area that's preventing it from rotating that direction. And the pitch system is what makes that happen. Um, because of uh, the importance of that, it's a very important system to be able to pitch the blades. That's the primary means of stopping the rotor. You see a break there, but that's more for maintenance purposes or extreme emergencies. The primary means of breaking the rotor is just by pitching the blades. And that's an important function. So inside the hub, there are battery backup systems. Um, on our wind turbine, it's just a bank of lead acid batteries that continually spin round and round. Um, they need to be replaced every so often and that's not a very fun job. <laughs> Hauling up lead acid batteries to the very top of the turbine and into the hub is, and they always seem to fail right in the coldest part of the winter. Like most people have problems with their car batteries then. Um, so that's always a fun task. Uh, but that's an important thing to, if there is a power outage, we need to have the function on those pitch motors to be able to pitch the blades out and stop the rotor from spinning. Um, so let's see, what else to highlight here? There's a yaw motor, a yaw drive. So the entire top of the, of the turbine, uh, we often refer to it as the nacelle. It's the, the housing that encloses all the equipment at the top. That entire top turns to face the wind. It gets the wind direction from the wind vane here. And then there's big gear motors. Our wind turbine has four big gear motors that um, ride on a big gear ring at the top of the tower and rotate the entire top of the turbine to face into the wind direction. 
Uh, that's a lot of mass to move. Uh, I think uh, the entire top of our turbine weighs about 400,000 pounds. The rotor itself weighs 130,000 and the gearbox and generators weigh, weigh I think around 260 uh, thousand pounds. So it's a, it's a very big mass that needs to move. It does not move fast. Um, and when it's pitching or yawing into the wind, um, the power has to get down still to the ground. So there's a, a, a drip loop. There's a bunch of large cables that are in a, a loop there and they get twisted as, as the turbine turns. And so the turbine counts how many times it's twisted those cables. After three twists, it's, it stops. And they're very twisted up at that point. It stops and will shut down and unwind. And it, it takes, uh, to give you a sense for how fast the yaw is, it takes almost 45 minutes to untwist three times. So it's not, it's not a fast movement, but it doesn't need to be. Generally, uh, wind direction changes are very small. It's just kind of making small adjustments to keep pointed in the right direction. And uh, it generally, it doesn't get too twisted up because the wind is often oscillating back and forth around one direction, not abruptly changing a lot. Um, you've got the low speed shaft here that's attached to the rotor and goes into the gearbox, which then um, spins the generator. And on our wind turbine, we have a 73 time gear ratio. So for every one rotation of the rotor, the generator spins 73 times. So for the, the, the rated speed of the turbine, the, the speed that it, it likes to operate at, that it's optimized to operate at, is uh, uh, the rotor spinning at 15.5 RPM. So that, that equates to about uh, 1,130 RPM in the generator. So it, when you drive down the highway and it doesn't look like the, the turbines are spinning very fast, there's a, there's a large gear ratio in the gearbox and it's spinning the generators quite fast. Um, some more specs on our wind turbine. Um, the tower height is 80 meters. It's a fairly standard hub height. Uh, they are getting taller, um, but a lot of them you see are 80 meter hub height. That, and that's about 26 stories tall to, to the hub here. Uh, the blades extend up to about 425 feet. Uh, the rotor diameter is 96 meters. So if you figure a meter is about a yard, that means the rotor diameter of this turbine is about a football field. It's almost 100 yards across. So it's a, it's a fairly massive uh, span there. And the blades are, uh, well, I have some slides on this later, but we installed some custom sensors in the blades. And the, the base, the, the root of the blade where it connects to the hub, um, it's hollow and it's large enough that I stood inside with my hands above my head. Uh, so it, the, the, just to give you a sense of scale. And the, the M on the side of the tower here is, uh, I think it's five feet tall and 10 feet wide, if that can give you a little bit more sense of scale. Uh, the the cut-in speed is four meters per second. So it requires a wind speed of almost nine miles an hour to start generating power. Uh, that's the speed, the wind speed that's required just to overcome the, the inertia of the rotor to get it to start spinning uh, fast enough to generate power. And then above 25 meters per second, uh, the turbine shuts down. At, at that point, that's a sustained 10 minute average wind speed. But if we have sustained wind speeds of 56 miles an hour, it's, it's uh, no longer safe to operate the turbine. Uh, so we, we shut it down to preserve mechanical equipment, essentially. Um, here's the, the power curve. So this is showing power output for different wind speeds all the way from zero wind speed through cutout at 25 meters per second. And uh, the thing I really want to point out here is just that the uh, maximum power output um, occurs at, uh, well, obviously all the way up to 25, but it starts at 13 meters per second. So the, the machine is optimized to create maximum power output at 13 meters per second. That means above 13 meters per second, you could technically be capturing more wind, but those events are more rare. So we've optimized it to try to capture the most amount of power at 13 meters per second, which is a wind speed that we expect to see more frequently. Um, there's different operating um, regions, we call them, for the turbine uh, and throughout this power curve. From uh, cut in to 13 meters per second, um, we're increasing power with increasing wind speed. And we're always, we're always trying to maintain the same hub speed. We want the rotor to be spinning at a roughly 15.5 RPM. That's the, the, the optimized rotational speed for both aerodynamics and uh, generators. And so to maintain that, to regulate that speed 
from uh, four meters per second to 13 meters per second, we add generator torque. Um, so you're asking the generators for more power output, which increases the torque on the rotor and slows it down. And as you increase torque, you get more power back. At 13 meters per second, you're asking the generators for everything they've got. They've got no more. So at that point, you begin to shed load by feathering the blades. So from four to 13, the blades are at roughly a fixed uh, angle of attack. Above 13, you now start to feather the blades out to regulate the speed because your torque is now constant from the generators. And to maintain that 15.5 RPM, you begin to feather the blades and shed, shed power and shed load. Uh, here's some um, power production stats for us. Um, I, I looked at, uh, okay. I looked at the average American household uh, power usage in 2015, and there was about, uh, the average power usage was 10.8 megawatt hours. So if you look at this roughly, we well, power on average uh, 309 homes a year. Uh, producing, we produce you know, around 3000 megawatt hours a year just from this one single turbine. So this is kind of the schematic of our Clipper wind turbine. Uh, we have kind of a unique gearbox that has uh, four generators instead of one big generator, and that's kind of unique. Uh, it's designed that way so that each generator weighs two tons or less and can be lowered with an onboard jib hoist, which is right here. There's 300 feet of chain in a five gallon or a 55 gallon drum right here, and you can lower those generators down. Uh, these here are uh, platforms for technicians to walk on. Uh, and it's a large space. We've had probably close to seven people up there at a time. It's a very large. Uh, place and in the next slide here, I've got a video of I put a GoPro on my hard hat, and I'll be standing right there looking towards the rotor. I might pause the video a couple times to highlight a few things, um, but it's looking good, Barbara and Joel. Video playing, okay, good. Uh, so you can see the rotor turning. Uh, there's a window here that people are looking out. I'm going to pause it right here. So th this here is a a, a pin lock ring. So if you're going to work on the rotor at all, you don't want it to move, uh, especially if you're going to be in the hub. You don't want to get tumble dried. Uh, so you lock it out. There's a huge steel pin that goes into that hole to retain the hub and keep it from moving. We drive it in with the big hydraulic actuator. And then to access the hub, you actually crawl through this small hole in the hub, which uh, even though it's a tight squeeze is actually a luxury. A lot of wind turbines to get into the hub, you have to go out on the roof and kind of rappel over the front in the nose cone and in that way, which uh, I'm not sure I could do. <laughs> it's a little too exciting for me. Uh, so I much prefer climbing through the small hole. Uh, let's play the rest of the video here. So I'm climbing up um, on essentially on the main bearing for the low speed shaft. That's the gearbox you can see. And I'm gonna poke my head out the roof uh, to take a look at the blades and you can see some of the landscape around the turbine. So I'm about 26 stories in the air. And from there, um, even though we're about 30 miles away, you can see the Minneapolis skyline. I don't think you can see it in this video, but uh, from up there, you can see the Minneapolis skyline. So we want the rotor, it's, it's, we call this pinwheeling. It's slowly turning, uh, even though it's not generating power. And we like that because uh, it's 130,000 pounds that's um, sitting on a bearing. and uh, you don't like it to sit still for too long. It can pit the bearing races and uh, you just want it to stay nice and lubricated. So uh, whenever possible, we like it to pinwheel. Obviously, if you're working on the rotor, you got to pin it and leave it. But in general, we like it to keep moving to stay lubricated. Here's a nice picture of sense of scale. This is me eight years ago uh, or more, nine years ago. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, that's me standing next to the, the rotor, the hub and the blades before it's still being assembled there. And then it'll be lifted onto the, onto the turbine. So here's a time lapse of construction. Uh, we've got the tower came in four, four steel sections, um, each weighed about 100,000 pounds. The, at the base, it's about 14 feet in diameter and the steel thickness is about an inch and a half. It tapers as it goes up both in diameter and steel thickness, tower thickness. Um, so those four sections were put on and then they're going to start assembling the rotor. So uh, actually I want to talk a little bit about the last tower section here. You'll see that this last tower section gets put on and at the time lapse it gets dark that day. And that's because uh, once they put the top tower section on, the manufacturer requires them to put the gearbox and generators on as a damping 
mass at the top because otherwise you could get vortex shedding on the sides of the tower and create, uh, you could excite some harmonics and actually destroy the tower. And it's the same reason you see a lot of tall smokestacks with a spiral around the outside. It's to break that vortex shedding and prevent it from oscillating too much. Uh, the next thing they're gonna do is assemble the rotor on the ground. They're gonna put all three blades connected to the hub, get everything all set up. And then to the two cranes that you see are gonna have to lift in tandem. The smaller crane is going to lift until it's high enough that it can lower and, and tip the rotor upright. And this is a very challenging lift. Um, you're hopefully building your wind turbine in a very windy location. And the rotor you're lifting is designed to catch the wind. But when you're lifting it, you really don't want it to blow around too much. Uh, so you're, you're kind of hoping that the wind conditions are, the weather conditions are right that day. And as you'll see, once the main crane has it, uh, that, that one crane is essentially lifting the rotor all by itself. And the operator has to line up like 80 bolts blind essentially. So there's people up top with radios, but he has to line up that rotor and get the bolts attached um, without really seeing what, what's going on. So that was one of the coolest things I've got to see uh, in person. It's a pretty remarkable thing to see something that's a football field in diameter get lifted up 26 stories and attached. Um, since our site is primarily used for research, uh, we added a number of custom sensor systems. So there's 20 strain gauges, 20 temperature gauges, and three accelerometers in each of the three blades. And uh, all wind turbines have a, a supervisory control and data acquisition system um, industry-wide. But we try to keep more high resolution data instead of uh, doing some data reduction and averaging the data down so it takes up less hard drive space. We, tend, we try to keep uh, one second records of over 300 parameters. So I could go back eight years and look at second by second what the wind turbine was doing. We also built a, a, a large MET tower, which is not standard for wind farms. It's 130 meters tall and it has mostly wind speed and direction, temperature and relative humidity measurements. And it's designed to give us a good understanding of the conditions the turbine's operating in. And we also have foundation instrumentation uh, to understand the load that the tower is applying to the foundation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, this gives kind of a schematic showing the elevations of the of the MET tower and where the sensors are. So they, they roughly correlate to the top tip of the rotor, the hub height, at the bottom of the sweep area, and then 10 meters, which is a standard meteorological measurement height. And then there's a few other ones just kind of sprinkled throughout. But it, it's designed to give us a very good picture of the environmental conditions that the turbine's operating in. So this is a picture from actually from the top of the turbine looking down. So since the top of the MET tower is at the top tip of the blade, you're actually looking down. And the picture was taken by Dick, our research technician, who's climbing up the tower right there. You can see the, the wind speed systems, uh, measurement systems, the sonic anemometer and the coupling vein anemometer. So then in this slide, we have um, a storm front rolling through. So this is a good example of yaw on the turbine. It's currently facing southeast, and the storm is coming from the northwest. You kind of see it. First, I should say this video is sped up 20 times actual speed to make it shorter to watch. The turbine's not actually spinning that fast. Um, so it's yawing to face the wind. And then you can see on the, the graphs here, the wind velocity increasing from the MET tower. The temperature of the arrows is also representing, or the color is representing temperature, excuse me. So you can see the temperature change. Uh, this top one is, is a 3D representation. So you can kind of see the turbulence um, as the wind direction rapidly changes. And the bottom right shows just the, the magnitude of, of the wind velocity. So it's, it's kind of a demo of a demonstration of like what we can do with all this data. You can kind of understand more of the, the full picture of what's happening. Um, the blade sensor systems, we have uh, 10 fiber optic strain gauges and 10 fiber optic temperature gauges in the blades. And then there's three DC accelerometers in each of the blades as well. And uh, I'd like to point out here that this picture on the bottom right, the, the blades are made out of kind of a surprising material, um, primarily fiberglass, and there's some balsa wood in there. You can kind of see the balsa. The balsa is more of a filler. All the structural is obviously from the fiberglass. Um, so there's a picture of one of our research technicians installing um, strain gauges and temperature gauges on the blades. Uh, there he is inside, so you can kind of get a better picture of of what the interior of the blade looks like. This is obviously when the blades are still on the ground uh, before we they were attached to the hub and lifted. 
we installed all these sensors. And I want to just point out that the uh, the structural, the main structural member of the blade is called a box beam. And you can see that in this picture. There's these members that go down um, and it's, the blade is sitting at a 45 degree angle roughly on its shipping fixture. So that's why it's kind of at an angle here. And uh, I like to, I'll show a little bit of the video here. Um, but we, we wanted to install accelerometers as far out in the blade as possible. Ideally at the very tip to measure deflection and how the blade responds to turbulence. So we talked to the manufacturer and said, okay, we'd like to do this. And they said, all right, we make the blades in two halves in molds and then we put them together. So why don't you fly down to the manufacturing plant and put the accelerometers in before we close them up. I said, great, sounds good. Let us know. And then a few weeks later they said, no, nah, supply chain's changed. Uh, we, your blades are done and they're in Texas already. They're going to be on their way to you soon. So now we had to come up with a new way to get accelerometers in as far as we could possibly go. So one of my coworkers created a, uh, I like to call it a robot on a stick, but it had six wheels and it rolled kind of in this corner of the box beam. And we put pneumatic actuators on it and that we could put the accelerometers on and rolled it in. So here's a, a video, we put a camera on it so that we could see what we were doing. Um, first we cleaned the surface with some uh, sponges, <laughs> very high tech, and some degreaser and just kind of clean the surface to make sure the epoxy would adhere as, as good as possible. And, but it just gives you a nice view of what the blade material is like. You can very easily see the fiberglass and the balsa wood in there. Um, so we cleaned it off, then um, cleaned off the accelerometers here. This video is sped up two times actual speed so that I can get through it faster. Um, cleaned these off. Let's skip ahead just a little bit. So it's going into the blade now. There's a, a closeout hatch that allows you to access the blades. And then uh, you'll see it roll down the box beam. The epoxy is not on the sensors yet, just because um, we need, once the epoxy went on, we had 10 minutes before it's set up. So we're gonna roll it in as far as we could go and still reach it. And then we'll apply the epoxy. So this is, this is a really nice view of highlighting that structural member of the, of the blades themselves, the box beam. <clears throat> and then we apply the epoxy. But this is, this is one of the reasons I really like my job. I think this is just a very elegant solution to a tricky problem. We had not a lot of time and we had to get these sensors into a very tight space that was too small to crawl in. You couldn't, you couldn't crawl that far. So we came up with a, a robot on a stick. Um, so you can see in there, we waited an hour, retracted them and were able to do a little bit of visual inspection with the camera. And uh, the cables were dr dragged out simultaneously with a little hook and, and that's that's how we got them in there. So they're still spinning around in the hub uh, about 110 feet from the hub. They're spinning around in the blades about 110 feet from the hub. Okay, questions. I'm probably taking too long. How am I doing, Joel? We are going to need to start picking it up, Chris, but Sorry. I am going to take the top upvoted question that we've had submitted this far. We've had over 20 questions submitted, which is amazing. Um, but the most upvoted question is this. Given the big farms of multiple turbines, is there a general rule of thumb besides turbine blade size itself as to how close two turbines can be to one another? Mm. Yeah, there is. Um... The, the, the turbines create wakes. You can imagine like a, a, a wake behind a boat and eventually that wake kind of dissipates. Uh, and in that wake, you're going to have lower wind velocity. So there are some, some um, rules of thumb on spacing. It's usually dependent on, it's usually given in units of rotor diameters. So it's like, I forget the number, that's the rule of thumb, but it's so many rotor diameters downstream. Um, so ideally you'd space them like that. A lot of times in, in practice, spacing is, is dependent as much as anything on just land use and where you're able to construct them. Um, but you definitely don't want them too close because if they're behind each other, um, the upwind one is gonna slow the wind down. It's, you're extracting energy from it, so it's gonna be slower for the next one. Uh, but the, we did, well, some of our projects have been modeling that and trying to get a better understanding of, of how much energy is taken out of the wind by one that's up, upwind. 
So just FYI, the two gentlemen that are featured on this slide, this is Chris Feist, who's climbing up the ladder, and Matt Luker. They are online right now, and they've said that they're going to start typing some of the answers to some of the other submitted questions. And so they'll start kind of working through that list of questions. But Chris, continue on, good man. Thanks, guys. I'm talking too much. All right. Uh, research at ELO. So I want to touch on a few projects. I'm going to try to move through these fast because I am taking too long and I want to get you guys all back to work after your lunch breaks. Um, so I'll try to move fast. If you do have questions, submit them and I'll let Matt and Chris take a stab at answering them. Um, so we have uh, developing foundation health assessment tools. Uh, this one's kind of near and dear to my heart. I've worked on this one a lot. And it was funded by Excel Energy through their Renewable Development Fund. But the main objective was just to develop some tools to, to measure the health of foundations. They're, um, it's a huge block of concrete in the soil. When we're in person, I like to ask people to guess how deep the foundations go. And I get answers from 100 feet to 5 feet, how deep that thing is buried in the soil. The answer for our turbine is only 10 feet but it has 45 trucks worth of concrete in it and 11 tons of reinforcement steel. Uh, you can see a picture of it being poured here, um, but even still it moves. Um, it, it weighs almost 2 million pounds and then it's covered with dirt, but it still moves. There's a huge overturning moment that's being applied to it. Uh, it's a 26 story tall tower with something designed to catch the wind at the top. Um, and then there's a big push lately to try to repower turbines. So after about, the, the turbines are designed for a 15 to 20 year lifespan. And we're seeing a lot of owners when they get to about 10 years, looking at taking all the mechanical components off the top and replacing them, trying to maintain the tower and foundation and uh, you know, protect those investments. But before they do that, they need to make sure that the foundation is okay. And sometimes it, it is not okay, especially after extreme events like a tornado or a big storm or in a major component failure. You can imagine if you've got 130,000 pound rotor that's spinning at 15 RPM and then the gearbox seizes up very suddenly and it stops fast, that's gonna cause problems. And so we're trying to develop a way to assess the foundation's health without having to dig it all up with a backhoe and core it. So we came up with uh, strain gauges on the tower, you know, the, the strain in the tower and the structural properties of that steel. You can compute the overturning moment that's actually being applied to the foundation. And then we have a, a biaxial tilt meter that measures um, very small um, changes in tilt up to a thousandth of a degree of rotation. So with that, we can get a, a measure of rotational stiffness. It's uh, units of giganewton meters per radian, and that's specified by the manufacturer of turbines. The manufacturer doesn't design the foundation, that's up to local engineering firms, in our case, Bar Engineering. And uh, they're required to design a foundation that meets the minimum rotational stiffness. And so we're just making sure that it still meets that. Um, then this plot here on the right shows overturning moment um, over different wind speeds. And the thing I just wanna point out is that you, very clearly you can see that the maximum load on the foundation occurs at around 13 meters per second, which is rated power. Because above that, the blades begin to feather out and shed load. And this was just, uh, I just like to point that out because it was very counterintuitive to me the first time I saw this plot. I figured higher wind means more load, but it actually decreases above 13 meters per second because you're feathering the blades out. Uh, here's a sim the same storm, but now you're seeing the, uh, foundation sensor system. So I like to point out here that the rotor, like I said, weighs 130,000 pounds and it's offset from the tower. So it actually creates compression on the side of that tower. It's leaning the tower essentially that direction. And you can see that compression follow the rotor around as it yaws. But as soon as it catches the wind, thrust from the blade kicks it back and you see the loading go the opposite direction. The bottom right, you see the power increasing and decreasing. And when it hits rated power, so you see this uh, airfoil here is now beginning to change pitch angle to regulate that hub speed and keep it at that 15.5 RPM. Um, another project we did was on uh, wind turbine acoustic noise. And uh, this has become kind of a hot button issue in the last couple of years with people uh, who live near wind farms complaining about um, of noise, uh, that they can hear the turbines and in and, and some cases, uh, say that they've been causing uh, adverse health effects. 
So we really wanted to kind of get into this and understand what could be causing this. Um, so we started to collect, uh, we recorded a bunch of noise from wind turbines, both ours and an Excel Energy farm. And then we partnered with the University of Minnesota's Department of Speech, Language and Hearing, uh, who do a lot of human response testing. They have a number of labs on campus set up for getting volunteers in and getting their response to different sounds and how they perceive sounds. So we worked with them and the goal is to develop guidelines for noise monitoring and uh, you know, how spacing of wind turbines from residential areas. Uh, so we measured, like I said, at our wind turbine and at this uh, Excel Energy farm. They were nice enough to let us out there to make a lot of measurements. Uh, this is a 100 turbine farm. You can see here's Chris who's answering questions apparently and uh, his, his uh, microphones out there on the road. And then the human testing, we, uh, we got volunteers. I think we had about 70 different volunteers in two phases of the project, 50 in the first phase and 20 in the second phase. And um, we had them, you know, complete a general health survey. Um, no one, uh, people were aware that they were gonna be listening to sounds, but we didn't tell them that it was necessarily from a wind turbine uh, in case they had any sort of knowledge of this issue and had an opinion formed on it. So we, uh, we tried to not tell them with the source of the noise, just that they were gonna be hearing some noise. And then uh, I think the int most interesting part of this is that uh, some of the adverse health effects that people have been referencing are in reference to uh, infrasound. So sound that you can't hear, but you can feel it in your, like in your chest, right? It's uh, like when the, the big drums go by in the marching band, you can feel it in your chest. Um, so the, the wind turbines create infrasound and people are saying that that's probably where the health effects come from and it, it can generate motion sickness. It, it affects the, your balance, essentially, they, they're claiming. So we wanted to test that. So what we did is we had our volunteers stand on a force plate. So this is a, a plate, it looks like a bathroom scale kind of, you can see it here in this picture, but it measures their natural sway of their body as they stand there. And the, uh, there's been a number of published papers that indicate that um, people who are motion sick sway more. They're trying to regain their balance. So we would be able to pick this up on that force plate. If people are getting motion sick, we'll see an increase in sway. So this plot sort is kind of confusing, but it shows the results of that sway. And uh, let's look at the right side here first. What this is showing is the difference of sway velocity, how much they're swaying when the infrasound pulses are on versus when they're off. And what it's showing is that there's not a lot of sway differences, about a zero percent, a little less than zero percent, so a negative difference, um, but very close to zero difference in sway when that infrasound signal is on versus when it's off. And the left side here is kind of a control and it's showing the difference in sway velocity at the beginning of the test and the end of the test. The test is 45 minutes long. They have to stand on this plate and they get one break in there. Um, so what we actually found was that people swayed more due to just fatigue than they did due to any sound that we played. And uh, any building you're in, where you are right now, there is infrasound from trucks driving by from anything, there's infrasound. And so the infrasound played in this test was actually well above what we measured in the field because we had to get it above the noise floor of the environment that we were doing the testing in. So we didn't see in this study any, um, any sort of motion sickness as a result of infrasound. Another project we did was developing advanced control algorithms. This one's still kind of ongoing. And uh, I'm trying to move quickly here. So I'll just point out that the, uh, this is a wind velocity profile. So it gets windier as you go up. And our, this is an example from January, 2014. Our hub height of our wind turbine is at 80 meters. So the, the wind velocity there is about seven but the top of the blade is up at about 130 meters. So at this time it was over eight. And at the bottom is down here, it's about five. So there's a fairly significant uh, velocity difference there. And that means that as the blades rotate through one rotation, they're experiencing different loading at the top than they are at the bottom. And that it, in, it creates an uneven loading, tipping the rotor back which then you know, moves its way through with the system. So then it flexes the main shaft, which then makes gears not align correctly. So what we wanted to do was design an algorithm that made use of the strain gauges in our blade. So there's four on the root of the blade where they connect to the hub. And that allows us to measure the load on the blade. 
And so we uh, partnered with aerospace engineering and they developed an algorithm to uh, a postdoc there developed an algorithm to pitch the blades differently within one rotation so that it, it can alleviate that. So here's kind of a plot of the results of that. The red line is the collective pitch. So if all three blades were pitching exactly the same like they do in normal operation, this is what the pitch would be. And then we kind of superimpose this sinusoidal oscillation on top of that. And that's changing at the top and at the bottom to try to uh, alleviate some of that loading. So there's a cyclic pitch happening within each rotation to try to shed some of that load and alleviate the out of plane bending. Okay, talking fast, hopefully not too fast. I got a lot of material. That's great, Chris. Um, Matt and Chris are doing a great job of working through our question list. So we have approximately 10 minutes left. And so I'm just going to tell you, take your drink and go. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Matt and Chris. All right. Some interesting research that we've been able to do since we live in Minnesota. Um, I'm going to just play the videos and talk over them. So basically there's this uh, a measurement technique called particle image velocimetry. That's used in the wind tunnel a lot. And ideally, you have a neutrally buoyant particle and you illuminate it with a laser sheet. No one's done it to this scale before uh, on a full scale wind turbine. So we decided to make use of our natural snowfall and a spotlight. So we had a five kilowatt spotlight shined on a convex um, mirror to turn it into a light sheet and went out in a snowstorm. We had some brave graduate students, some of which are probably on this call, who went out in the middle of snowstorms in the middle of the night to capture these videos. But they show this tip vortex, which has, you know, a lot of numerical models have shown this, and this allows us to actually vis visualize this helical uh, tip vortice as it moves through. And very interesting behavior we've been able to see. So you can see this, this is a cross section of here, this is a cross section of this helical vortex that's forming on the blade tips as it moves by. Um, here's another view of it. You can see the actual um, helical part. This is, you know, perpendicular. The, the sheet, light sheet is perpendicular to the last one. So you can actually see this uh, helical vortex pass through the plane. And what's been really interesting is to, to visualize different you know, in a lot of numerical models, it's a very, like that one you saw, it's a very consistent, evenly spaced helix. Well, here you can see that in all the turbulent environment of the real, the real world, these vortices don't stay evenly spaced. They um, kind of leapfrog here, or they spiral around each other. And this, this, kind, of, this kind of research is important for uh, the question that was asked earlier about spacing wind turbines. Understanding these wakes and how they dissipate and how they react and how they spread or contract and things like that is important for spacing. So this is important research for understanding that. Okay, Barbara said to skip questions, so I'm doing that. Um, this has been one of my favorite projects to work on. Um, we could partner with the University of Minnesota Raptor Center, which is a, an amazing facility. Uh, I doubt they're doing tours right now, but when they open up again, you should definitely go check out their facility on the St. Paul campus. Uh, we'll be partnered with them and uh, bald eagles and golden eagles um, are occasionally hit by wind turbines. The, the blades strike them and, and, it, and it causes an issue. And it's especially an issue with bald and golden eagles because they're federally protected under the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Um, so it, it becomes, uh, Besides a conservation issue, it's also a legal issue for wind farm operators. Um, it's a federal offense to even inadvertently kill a bald eagle or a golden eagle. So it, it becomes a, a, a big liability for wind farm operators. And there's been this theory proposed that maybe we could find a sound that would scare them away. And, and, um, and as we looked into research, we couldn't find anywhere where people had measured the hearing uh, freak, the frequency range that humans, uh, that eagles can hear. Humans hear 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. And, uh, but it wasn't really understood where in that range eagles can hear. Uh, what sounds would you play to try to scare an eagle away? What do they hear? Dog whistles. They hear very high frequency sounds that we can't hear. Do eagles hearing ranges fall in the same range as humans? Um, we started by just kind of measuring, uh, recording eagle calls. We figured they can probably hear each other. Uh, so we kind of started with that and analyzed that. There's an eagle call that we recorded at the Raptor Center. 
kind of look at the frequency content of that call and what kind of where it where it lies. And then we did a thing, uh, you can't ask an eagle what it can hear. Um, so what we did is uh, I did a, what's called an auditory brainstem response. And on the left is my daughter, who's now two. And on the right is a red-tailed hawk, and they're having the same test done, essentially. In infants, we do the test just to assess whether they can hear. They do it after 24 hours of being born, and they, and they just put these little, like, suction cup headphones on them and play sounds and measure their brain waves. They're actually measuring the brain waves to see that the, the nerves in the ear are transmitting the sound to the brain. So that means they heard the sound. So for this eagle or red-tailed hawk here, we can't get them to hold still, so we sedate them. The Raptor Center veterinarians did. And then we put electrodes on their skull, and this is a speaker right above its ear. And we played sounds from low frequency to high frequency at different volumes and mapped their whole hearing space. Uh, this is just a fun video of Chris Feist with an eagle. Uh, fun fact, they transport eagles, or the Raptor Center transports eagles just like this. They ride shotgun in the minivans. Uh, they said they get a lot of funny looks at stoplights. Um, but uh, instead of putting them in a cage, they just hold them like a baby. Um, we don't, the Raptor Center didn't have a lot of golden eagles. Uh, they're not as common in Minnesota. So we actually traveled to Oklahoma and partnered with the Comanches to work with their eagles. Um, this was uh, incredible to get to be there and, and a little bit more uh, intense. These, these birds have extreme uh, cultural and spiritual significance to these people and they all have names and um, have been raised, some of them from, from hatchlings. And so to actually have to get permission to, to study them, to sedate them and, and study them was, it was, very, uh, it was very cool and a, a big responsibility. Um, and at the, when we did studies at the University of Minnesota, we had speech language and hearing has a number of big soundproof booths that we were able to use to limit ambient noise and make sure the birds were only hearing the noises we played. Uh, here's a picture of a, I think this is a golden eagle uh, ear. I'd never seen one until this project. Uh, it took a while, sometimes it takes a while to part all the feathers to find their ear. Um, but in Oklahoma, we didn't have access to those really nice soundproof booths, so we built a mobile sound chamber. We affectionately called it Merle, the Mobile Evoked Auditory Response Laboratory. Uh, it had to be disassembled enough to be able to be driven to Oklahoma. And on the right, you can see a golden eagle being set up for ABR testing. So the results show um, the bald eagle hearing threshold. On the left here, this is what humans can hear. Our sweet spot is about four kilohertz. And um, eagles, both bald and golden, and we also studied some red-tailed hawks in there too. Their sweet spot is about 2,000 hertz. So it's, it's very similar to humans. Um, I guess I was sort of hoping they would hear really high frequency noises that we can't hear so that we could play some sort of deterrent signal to scare them away that we wouldn't bother people, but it looks like their hearing ranges are very much on top of ours. We then did a pilot study on what is, how do eagles feel about different sounds? So we went to the Raptor Center. They have these, uh, they're kind of like recovery rooms when birds are injured and they can't be released yet. They hang out in these rooms with padded walls. And we um, set up some speakers and a camera and recorded their response to these different um, stimuli. So there's both natural sounds that we recorded of eagles, typically that aren't very happy. They're about to have surgery or something at the Raptor Center. And we figured maybe a distress call being played would kind of alarm them. And then we also played a number of like beats essentially, and um, almost sounds like sirens. So here's the, well, an eagle. Uh, I've removed the stimulus from there, but you can see the little red light blink when the stimulus was played. And it, it's hard to quantify like how much did the bird react to that? Was it scared of it? Was it just curious? So we had, we created these videos and submitted them to a panel of essentially experts. Uh, different veterinarians or people who study hearing and behavioral response in humans and had them um, review these videos and, and tell us like, do you think the bird was responding to that? We had randomized whether the sound came from the left or came from the right. Do you think the bird was able to identify where it came from um, and how did it respond? And we had people submit their, their review of that. 
Um, we hope to do some more of that research. I think we have a few proposals out to continue this. This was just a pilot study with three bald eagles just to kind of set up how would we do a study on. Now that we know what they can hear, that doesn't necessarily mean we know what sounds would scare them away or cause them to, to react. So we need to take it one step further. We know what they can hear. What do they do when they hear it? Um, so we'd like to continue that research. And here's some pictures just to make you all jealous of what this normally looks like. Um, there's an office space. Looks like Joelle buys everybody dinner when it's there. So you might have to give her a hard time about that. And uh, then we all go out to the wind turbine, get to look at it, shut it down and people get to put on their hard hats and go take a look. Okay, how'd I do on time? You squeaked it in. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> and just FYI, and so as uh, uh, Chris Feist and Matt Luker have been answering questions, I've been typing in an answer that moves them to the answered section of the Q&A. So if you wanted to go and review some of those answers, feel free to do so. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Joelle briefly uh, because she wants to make some kind of ending announcements since we are getting close to that 1 p.m. deadline. Um, but if you are interested in being able to have some more questions answered, um, Chris, are you willing and available to stick around and we're able to, able to answer some additional questions and so those who are able to, to stick around and ask questions can do so? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Yep. All right. Well, then, Joelle, back over to you. Great. Thanks, everybody. I'm just going to wrap us up quickly, um, and then we'll turn it back over to Chris for maybe an extra 10 minutes or so to try to get those final questions answered. You're welcome to stay on if you want. Just a reminder, if you have to pop off now, I will be sending the recording of the presentation to everyone who registered. So just because uh, you aren't able to stay doesn't mean you still can't hear uh, the questions being answered. Uh, that'll probably happen next week. When I send that email with uh, the link to the registration, I'll also include um, some additional resources for you, including the SAFL website, uh, the college's virtual engagement page, and some other events you can check out, um, and ways you can contact both Barbara and I with your questions. So um, stay tuned for that. All that will be in the follow-up email uh, to this presentation, and we'll include the link to the video if you are not able to stick around. But if you can stay on for a few more minutes, we'll try to get through as many of these questions as we can. Um, uh, before we wrap it up. So I'm going to turn it right back over to Barbara and Chris to, to get us through as many as we can here in maybe the next 10 minutes or so. All right. And, and uh, Chris Feist and Matt Luker, if you want to continue working through some questions as well, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm just going to start with the most upvoted one. Are you ready, Chris? Sure. All right, here we go. All right, Paul uh, submitted a question. The turbine annual output appears to be decreasing with time. How much of this is a fat feather, uh, sorry, a function of weather patterns and how much is associated with the turbine components and maintenance schedule? Ah, good question. Let me go back to that slide because why not? <laughs> okay, so yeah, it is decreasing. Um, and I think that's actually a function of, um, we've had some issues recently with our um, power inverters. So the, the turbine, it's kind of a unique system. Um, it has those four generators at the top actually generate um, their permanent magnet and they generate three phase AC power, but it's not at 60 Hertz. So it, it rectifies it up tower to DC and sends it down in four DC um, circuits, I guess. And then at the base of the tower, it gets rectified or inverted back to AC matching the 60 Hertz of the grid. And those, those inverters, uh, we've been having some issues with them, uh, especially in the hotter months. They, it seems sort of related to overheating and the, they'll cause problems. So what we've been doing is uh, just operating the turbine at a lower power output. We're primarily for research anyway. So meeting power production quotas isn't really our goal. Our goal is to conduct good research. So uh, we've just been kind of running the turbine at a lower power output. And I think that's probably the majority of why you see we're just not capturing quite as much power. Uh, and curtailment is what it's referred to is, is fairly common in the industry, uh, not always for mechanical errors. It's sometimes just for the power company doesn't need as much power that day or uh, sometimes it's for wildlife protection. Uh, bats in particular, they'll do curtailment uh, and just voluntarily make less power to protect bats, things like that. Hopefully that answers your question. All right, next question from Pete. 
What's the G-force if you were hanging onto the tip of the blade at max rotation? Ah, uh, boy. You could do the math. I haven't done that calculation. Um, but you could do the math, I think. It's a 96-meter rotor diameter. The rated uh, speed is 15.5 RPM. Uh, I think that's probably all you need to calculate uh, the G-force, I think. I've calculated the tip speed before, and it's... Uh, generally over 120 miles an hour uh, that it gets moving just because it's such a big big circle that it has to trace out so they look like they're moving very slow but the, the tips of turbine blades are generally moving about 120 miles an hour which is why birds sometimes have a hard time cool all right next question are larger number of smaller units more efficient and cost effective given higher costs for maintenance on large turbines? I guess I don't know the economics of it. Um, I think in general, larger turbines are, are better. Um, I guess I'm not exactly sure why. I, I, I guess I can say for sure that uh, the majority of power produced on our wind turbine, for example, the, the most lift created by the blades happens on the like the farthest out from the hub. And that, that's probably just because there's less rotational. You know, a lot of the mass is concentrated at the hub. And then the blades out there are moving very fast, so they can generate more lift. So I, I think in general, bigger is better. Um, I don't know the, the exact economics behind it, I guess. Um, I could look into that some more, <laughs> but that the the trend, the trend has definitely been towards bigger. Uh, there's places in California with just like tons and tons of little ones, and we see less and less of that, and much more big. And I think it it probably has to do with just buying one big inverter is cheaper than buying a bunch of little ones. And um, there's actually environmental uh, wildlife impacts too. I just, I've seen studies that there are more birds killed by little turbines than big ones. Um, for whatever reason. So I think environmentally, it's actually better to have big ones as well. All right. What's the typical operating capacity factor of the turbine based on your average annual output? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that's somebody who knows the wind industry there. Um, I don't know <laughs> it off the top of my head. <laughs> I don't know it off the top of my head. I, I would say if you're just curious about like this, this uh, brand, uh, this model turbine and the, our site, I don't know that our numbers would be accurate for capacity factor because since we are geared towards research, we are very willing to shut it down for two or like if we had been out at the turbine today, I would have shut it down for you to walk up to it. So we're clearly not motivated by capacity factor. Um, which is a capacity factor for people who don't know is just essentially like how much power have you produced uh, compared to how much you could produce if you were producing at maximum power output all the time. Um, this definitely is the advantage of, of us being a research wind turbine and so we're obviously connected to the grid but we're not beholden to generate a minimum amount of energy. Um, and, and that's so. been our, to our benefit. Uh, there's, there was a company in Scotland that actually came out here to work with us because they wanted to try some new control algorithms and were having a hard time finding a partner that would allow them to screw around in their turbine for multiple days when they could be producing power. And so they came out to us because we we're like, no, our, our main goal is research, uh, not power production. So in some ways, I think our capacity factor isn't a fair number. <laughs> Uh, so next question from Steve, do you also measure the low frequency sounds generated by the wind turbines and do research on abating those sounds? Um, we did measure that. We bought some special microphones that were capable of measuring all the way down to infrasound. And we have not done any research yet on abating them. Um, we've talked internally about how you might do that, but we haven't had any time to, we haven't had any funding to do it yet. I think that would be a very interesting project and we would definitely love to do that work. But yeah, we do have part of that microphone array that you saw in those pictures was for infrasound. Uh, I don't remember how low it went, but it went to very, very low frequencies and all the way up through the hearing range of the hearing frequency range of humans. So we were measuring that. And, and some of that infrasound is what we played 
to our human test subjects, volunteers. Are wind turbines cost competitive for their life considering maintenance costs? I think uh, lately they have, they've definitely improved and they are, um, they are cost competitive to other power sources. Um, I think you just get I mean, there's a much higher energy density in, a, in one wind turbine. The, the size of a solar array you would have to have to produce 2.5 megawatts is, is very big. It takes up a lot of land and wind turbines are fairly um, compact. You can farm right around them. And uh, I, I think th they have proven to be, over the years, they've gotten more and more cost effective. So I, I think they are fairly cost competitive right now. I don't have economic numbers to throw at you there, but uh, they have become fairly cost competitive. What magnitude of power improvements are being targeted by current research? Another way to ask it, what sort of plateau in efficiency and magnitude are we at? Um, so most of our research hasn't been focused as much on increasing efficiency, just because I think a lot of the efficiency needs to come into the design of the turbine itself, the blades, the gearbox, all that stuff. And since we have a turbine that's already built, already designed, it's harder to make uh, efficiency changes. We did do a little bit of research on the original grant on some um, films that you could put on the blades to reduce drag. Uh, so it was a 3M product that they had used successfully like on the bottom of race boats and things like that. It was modeled after shark skin to reduce drag. Uh, maybe the same kind of stuff in those like swimming suits that Olympic athletes wore for a little while before I think they were banned. But uh, it was a film that we had did some research in the wind tunnel on and it was designed to increase power efficiency by like 3%, I think. We estimated it could maybe increase 2 or 3%. But the, it just ended up being kind of cost prohibitive. It was going to cost a lot of money to install those on blades. You have to rappel down and glue them on and uh, maintenance on them. And I think the economics weren't there for that. Um, so most of our work has been more on alleviating loads and kind of studying the wake effects and uh, wildlife interactions at this point instead of trying to increase efficiency all right, so we're gonna take just a couple more questions. It looks like Matt and Chris are really taking it too for the rest of the, the, rest of the questions that have been submitted. Thanks uh, guys. <laughs> um, so here's one from Tasia. Tasia is one of our researchers that actually helped with a lot of that snow PIV work. So here comes Tasia's question, get ready for it. So did the infrasound test confirm that wind turbine noise does not cause motion sickness? Clarification. Um, we didn't see it in our study. Um, does that mean it is conclusively does not cause motion sickness? I, I don't think we can quite make that claim yet. Uh, we are particularly interested, uh, I think, we would like to do some more studies on individuals who are maybe prone to motion sickness, um, people who are easily car sick or get sick on rides. I think it would be interesting to look at those people um, but nothing, nothing we've seen yet suggests that, um, that infrasound causes motion sickness. We have not observed anything yet. All right, last question, and I'm choosing this one because I like that it looks forward. Could you comment on the next generation of blade design? Blade design. They're bigger. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I've seen news stories lately of our blades up to like 96 meters or more, probably for offshore turbines because they're just too hard to, to drive down the road here on land-based turbines. But um, they're definitely getting bigger. There is work being done on different materials. Uh, there's been some blades built on, out of carbon fiber. Um, I think that's just kind of cost prohibitive right now. It's a lot of carbon fiber, but they're much lighter. Um, I know some of the national labs, the Department of Energy's national labs are doing work on blades and looking at decreasing costs in manufacturing, uh, finding ways to make them bigger. Um, I guess I haven't done any blade design myself, so I don't know exactly uh, where we're going, but bigger for sure. Um, and I think there's a lot of things that need to be done to get them bigger. They need to be stronger and lighter. Uh, 
So yeah, bigger, stronger, lighter. All right. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up so everybody's able to continue on with their Thursday. Really appreciate the number of questions, 50 questions submitted as of right now. Um, obviously, all of you have Joelle's contact information. Um, feel free that uh, she can forward you my contact information as well. Um, but uh, we're really looking forward to just being able to continue to engage with folks. And uh, now you can tell people a little bit more about that wind turbine as you, you know, travel down Highway 55 to Rochester. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you so much, Chris, for your time. And Joelle, if there's anything else that you want to do to help us wrap up. Thank you just all for coming. Thanks again to Chris and Barbara and a big thanks to uh, the other Chris and Matt for jumping in on the Q&A. They were huge silent partners in making this event a success. And just a reminder that we'll be sharing the link to the recording probably sometime next week. And I'll include my contact information in that email as well as how you can get in touch with Sapple if you have more questions and some other resources you might want to check out. So for now, Thanks so much for joining us. And thanks again to Barbara and Chris for all the time and effort they put into making this presentation so informative. Uh, and we hope to see you again at another event sometime soon. Take care and have a great rest of your day.